So, good afternoon everyone, welcome. How wonderful it is to see so many people turned out for this event. My name is Justin Morris, I'm Director of Public Engagement um, here at the museum. I'd just like to say a few words and then I'm going to hand over um, to our special guests here um, to proceed with the unveiling of the statue. Um, so I think, as you know, these celebrations uh, have been a year-long program of events commemorating the death of Alfred Russell Wallace 100 years ago today and honouring his life and works. To pay tribute to this great naturalist, the museum will be installing a bronze statue of him in the grounds. And this statue captures the moment when Wallace first saw the golden birdwing butterfly during his expedition in Indonesia. And the species was new to science, and like many thousands of Wallace's specimens, is now in the collections of the Natural History Museum. The statue is a gift to the museum from the Wallace Memorial Fund. And on behalf of the museum, I have great pleasure in accepting this gift. And I'd like to thank all of those who were involved in making this possible, and in particular, the Wallace Memorial Fund, the donors who contributed to the commissioning of the statue, and in particular, Mark Ribbons, Alan Smith, and the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and of course, the sculptor, Anthony Smith. The installation of the statue will be a fitting legacy to the program of events that have combined to make the Wallace 100 program here at the museum. And it is indeed a splendid homage to one of the most significant collectors, the theorists of natural history of the modern era. So before I invite Sir David to unveil the statue, I'd like to introduce two speakers. Firstly, Richard Wallace, the grandson of the man himself. And secondly, Bill Bailey, the patron of the Wallace Memorial Fund. Thank you. I'd like to say on behalf of the Wallace family how pleased and proud we are that Wallace should at last have arrived here in this prestigious building which was the centre of so much of his work. Uh, I wonder how he would have viewed this evening. He was such a modest man. I think he would have been slightly amused by the whole, <laughs> whole thing, don't you? But our thanks, our thanks are due to all those people who have spent so much time and effort and thought and money to get this thing together. The money needed was quite a large sum and the time in which it had to be completed, a rather short time, it was a, a very bad mix. In fact, halfway through, we got into considerable trouble. The money was not coming in fast enough, and the deadline was approaching. And it looked as though we might have to settle for second best. But thanks to Mark Ribbons, who stepped up and virtually underwrote the thing, our thanks are due to him incalculable. So kind of you. Other contributors. Uh, Dr. Alan Smith, a thank you to him, uh, and to the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Uh, that was another hat that uh, that extraordinary man, my grandfather, could wear with quite considerable uh, aplomb. But. Uh, the whole list is very long and a very prestigious one, and I have been asked to be short, so I will uh, just add one more name to the list, and that is Dr. George Bettoloni, which is... George, we've known each other since back in the 90s, when you came looking for his grave. And you, I think, have done more, or yes, more than anyone I know, 
to bring grandfather out of the shadows of the last century where he'd almost disappeared. And this is very much your project. You have been the inspiration behind it. Your the time you have spent, I know something about the time and the effort and the research and the bit of wheedling that's gone on and possibly a bit of <laughs> a little bit of polite bullying, but you've got us here. Thank you, George and Jan, for all you have done for Wallace over the years. And thank you all for coming here tonight and making it the great occasion it is. Thank you so much for that. Hello, good evening. Um, friends, members of the Natural History Museum, Wallace aficionados, members of Wallace's family, fans of unveilings, generally. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, I'm delighted to be here for what is an historic moment, the unveiling of the world's first ever statue of Alfred Russell Wallace. I was here back in January to unveil his portrait uh, you know these Wallace unveilings, they're like uh, buses, you know, you wait a hundred years and then two come at once. Uh, there's many statues of Darwin, um, and up to now we've had to make do with just one luxuriantly bearded Victorian evolutionist, but not now. Plans for a statue of Wallace at the Natural History Museum began in 1913, but then the Great War intervened and it's been on hold until 2011 when Caroline Catchpole here at the museum gently persuaded George <laughs> to take up the idea of a statue which has now come to such wonderful fruition. There's many reasons I think why Wallace should be honored here in this way. He never lost his sense of awe and appreciation and love for the natural world. Feelings which I have also and which are replenished every time I come here to this museum. So it's entirely appropriate that he should reside here where those sentiments are so enshrined. Wallace was a brilliant naturalist. He was a prodigious collector of insects, birds, beetles, all manner of creatures. He amassed 126,000 specimens. 70% of them are held here at the museum and are still being studied today. Wallace made an enormous contribution to science, to the understanding of life on Earth. He is regarded as the father of an entirely new field of scientific study, evolutionary biogeography, the study of the distribution of fauna, why animals are where they are. And of course, alongside Darwin, he was the co-discoverer of the primary mechanism of evolution, natural selection. He had a lifelong sense of wonder and was frequently emotionally overcome at the sight of some particular specimen. And this statue beautifully captures this and his adventurous spirit. And at this point, I have to confess, I have had a sneak preview uh, of the statue, and it is a stunning piece of work. And perhaps I'll tell you just a brief moment about its um, evolution, I think is the right word here. <laughs> this life-size, well, I say life-size, it's 10% bigger than life-size. Uh, it's a bronze sculpture. It's the work of Anthony Smith, and who has many important commissions to his name, including a highly praised life-size sculpture of Charles Darwin, which resides at Christ College, Cambridge. It shows Wallace between the ages of 31 and 39, dressed in his expedition clothes, complete with butterfly net and collecting box. The sculpture, uh, as has been described, depicts the moment when Wallace first sees Ornithoptera croesus, the male golden birdwing butterfly, uh, when he was in the rainforest of the island of Bachan in eastern Indonesia. He's looking upwards in the statue, and when the... Uh, butterfly is actually installed, if you follow his gaze, you'll actually be able to see a bronze model of the butterfly some distance away on the glass facade of here, Darwin Center 2. And it's worth repeating the words which Wallace wrote about this moment, because I think this is what's unique about this, this sculpture. So many statues, the subjects look rather bored or very pleased with themselves. You know, like, hey, I'm a statue, get out of me. But this, this is a bit different. This is capturing a moment, and this these are the words which you can, you can uh, put into the statue because this is what Wallace was thinking at that moment. He says, when he sees the butterfly, the beauty and brilliancy of this insect are indescribable 
and none but a naturalist can understand the intense excitement I experienced when I at length captured it. On taking it out of my net and opening the glorious wings, my heart began to beat violently. The blood rushed to my head. I felt much more like fainting than I have done when in apprehension of immediate death. <laughs> I had a headache the rest of the day. So great was the excitement produced by what will appear to most people a very inadequate cause. See, this sums up Wallace for me. Passionate about the beauty of nature, acknowledging the joy in emotion that nature stirs within us, yet pragmatic, modest, and self-effacing. I feel very privileged to be part of this process. Uh, and as has been discussed, this is only one of a series of Wallace related events that have taken place throughout Britain, plays, exhibitions, lectures, all part of this, this wonderful celebration, Wallace 100. And right now, as we are here, events celebrating Wallace's legacy are happening all over the world. In India, Brazil, Malaysian Borneo, Taipei City in Taiwan, Wakatobi in northern Silhouette in Indonesia, in New York. Right now, uh, I have got the time, but it's, I think the time is right. In Boston, USA, Harvard professor Andrew Berry is preparing a talk entitled Evolution's Unsung Discoverer, asking the question, why has Wallace been eclipsed by Darwin in the populist imagination? And finally, and this is my favorite, an exhibition of Wallace's life and work is in the museum and gallery of the Northern Territory in Australia. Where in Australia? In Darwin, of course. <laughs> Of course, the prime mover in this project has been my old pal, Dr. George Beccoloni, uh, to give him his official title, Director of Coleoptera here at the Natural History Museum. And I think, George, what you've done here with your exhaustive research, you've summoned up the spirit of Wallace, I think. The meticulous attention to the accuracy of this sculpture is quite fantastic. Uh, and uh, the hat, uh, and indeed Wallace's likeness, came from a photograph taken in 1862 in Singapore. But here, he was wearing city clothes, not the clothes he would have worn in the field. So these had to be carefully constructed from clues in his writings. There's a small sketch made by Wallace in the Malay archipelago, but it's small and indistinct, and you can't really make out what he's really wearing. You can make out it's a loose white shirt, no cravat, and some white trousers. And there's an interesting detail. The trousers have no belt loops, which was the fashion at the time. The shirt is a Victorian gentleman's hunting shirt, which is quite unusual, as it had two breast pockets. And he talks of having to roll up his leg to show locals his white skin. So his sleeves would have been pulled down, as they are here. His trousers were tucked into his socks and into his leather boots to stop the leeches getting in, which, as I can attest, is a perfectly viable method, even today. He is hold he's got a collecting box. Um, uh, which is lined with cork for pinning specimens, and in his right hand is where his butterfly net resides. So, shirt, trousers, boots, hat, kit, beard, all present and correct. This is, of course, the culmination of a lot of hard work by many, many people. Um, George has been shepherding this project since the outset. There have been many donors, many significant contributions. The names have been mentioned so far. I'd like to thank all the speakers and performers and all the people that have been involved in Wallace 100. For, you know, this has been a, a fantastic collaborative effort. Thanks to Chris Jennard and all those involved in the Ancestors Trail. Um, and George, I have to say, our respective partners won't forgive us if we don't thank them. So I'd like to thank my wife Chris and Jan, of course, George's partner, Srila Banerjee, Sir Eric Thomas, Lucy Wainwright, Carolyn Catchpole, Judith McGee, Andy Polacek, Paul Gallagher, and Sherry Louise Rowe for all your fantastic support in this project. I am particularly delighted for Wallace's descendants because this, this is a very, very proud moment for you all. This is a wonderful counterpoint to the portrait that now hangs here alongside Darwin because in that painting, it depicts Wallace as the venerated man of science, adventuring days long gone butterfly net hung up. But this, this is Wallace in his element. During, as he put it, the central controlling incident of his life, his eight years in the Malay archipelago. So, on behalf of the Wallace Memorial Fund, 
a profound thank you to all concerned with bringing to the museum Wallace the naturalist, Wallace the explorer, Wallace the man of courage in the name of science. Thank you. And now, uh, um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, hand over to Sir David Attenborough, who will say a few words and conduct the unveiling. Sir David. There's not much for me to add to that excellent survey and summary the Bill has just given us all. Maybe just two aspects of this very great man, which I men might mention. The first is that his sheer, straightforward physical courage and endurance. If you have read his wonderful book on the Malay Archipelago, or rather if you haven't, I recommend you do. It's an extraordinary, wonderful book. And you have to read between the lines to see what endurance that man had for eight years, traveling in unreliable, leaky boats, native-made boats, from island to island, often without any companions at all, certainly not European companions, uh, living on local food, enduring all kinds of, of tribulations, with very little medicine, just quinine, that was about it. So that was one aspect which I make, moves me. And the other one is his sheer generosity of spirit and modesty. Uh, there are lots of people to make dramas out of the conflict, apparently, between Darwin and Wallace as to who in fact had priority, who thought of it first, who deserves the credit. It d didn't trouble either of those great, very great, generous spirited men. Uh, Wallace, uh, Darwin said to Wallace um, that uh, he admired everything he did and he could have written the work just as much as Darwin could. And Wallace said not at all. Darwin had done all the research. And these two men complimented one another all the time. And if you wanted to try and foment some argument between those two men, you won't find any evidence whatsoever. So here is an admirable man, a modest man, a tough man, a generous man, and a great scientist. And I am truly privileged to be able to unveil this statue to you. I haven't seen it either. <laughs>